Uh, and this is another minor correction. I haven't actually finished writing the book about chopsticks in the land of cotton, but hopefully by the end of the year. Um, but it, it's kind of related to uh, the Mississippi Chinese, who uh, actually outnumbered the Georgia Chinese in the like late 1800s, early 1900s. But they were recruited there as uh, labor replacements when the slaves were free and uh, the white plantation owners needed labor to help pick the cotton. So they brought in uh, maybe a hundred or so Chinese to do that. But the Chinese didn't like doing that and they were too smart. You know, they don't want to sit out there in the hot sun all day, you know, picking cotton. So they, they found that if they had opened these grocery stores, they could at least be indoors, you know, probably. And uh, so that, they, they didn't do that very long, but they got there. That's how they got there, sort of thing. And some of those maybe filtered over to Georgia, you know, uh, because I've talked to some Augusta Chinese who have relatives in Mississippi and this sort of thing. But a lot of that's kind of, you know, undocumented. Chinese also got recruited to go to Massachusetts to replace white um, shoemakers who were striking. Chinese got into a lot of occupations. And same thing in New Jersey, uh, white laundry workers were striking, so they would bring in Chinese. Some people think that um, some of these Chinese, um, you know, after they left that, that's how they learned the skills to go into laundry, you know, in that area. Because as you can imagine, those Chinese immigrants who came over did not do laundry in China. <laughs> you know, some of my, you know, adolescent white friends would think, oh, did your parents run a laundry in China before they came over here, you know? Uh, no way, right? None of those Chinese did laundry in, in China. That's something they learned to do here. So getting to Georgia, there was this a canal called the Augusta Canal, which was a source of hydroelectric uh, energy, which is very important because it enabled them to build textile mills so that um, they no longer just grew cotton and then shipped it up north. They could actually keep the cotton in the south and make more money, you know, uh, manufacturing textiles. So uh, Augusta probably uh, did have the largest representation of Chinese in the state of Georgia. And uh, my, my father has roots in Augusta in a way uh, because he had relatives there and he even worked there for a while. So. This is a demographic uh, to show you how few Chinese there were in the South, at least from the 1920 and 1930 census, U.S. census. So those numbers are like uh, less than 200 uh, men in either state, uh, women a lot fewer. Um, and even at the maximum, 1930, there's what, like less than 450 uh, men in uh, Mississippi, Chinese men in Mississippi. Um, now, in case you don't know the geography of the South, um, here's a little representation. See, Macon is um, literally in the middle of the state of Georgia, uh, right there. Uh, and um, all those little icons of uh, our old eight and a half pound uh, irons, those are where some Chinese laundries were that I know of. This is not to say these were all the Chinese laundries in the South, but all these Chinese laundries were relevant to my family history because they were all run by relatives of my uh, father in, in some sort of sense. Well, probably goes back to my great-great-grandfather. But these were all cousins, uh, uh, brothers, uh, etc. And uh, I didn't get to know all of them, but I knew of them. I, I heard people talk about them, and, and I've subsequently met some of them. So, uh, looking at my father's um, chronology, we say that he came from uh, Hoi Ping and in 1921 he came to San Francisco as an immigrant and stayed here for a short time. And then, because he had a, a grand uncle in Chattanooga, Tennessee, that's where he first went in uh, probably. Uh, 1921 is when he arrived, so he probably in 1922 or thereabouts, he went there for a while. And then he went and worked with another relative in Augusta for a few years. So he was in the United States as a single young man. And as many of you know, this is a prototypical um, model of immigration for Chinese. This is one of maybe a couple 
a single young man comes over, works for a while, earns some money, goes back to China, an arranged marriage, he married my mother, and then after a few months came back to Georgia and got his own laundry, this time in Macon. And uh, as it turns out, that laundry had been there a long time, but as a child, it never, I never thought, I was curious to know, well, gee, Dad, you know, how did you get this laundry? You know, I just thought somehow, I never even thought about it, but it was as if the laundry was started with us, and you know, when we left, the laundry was over. There was a history for that laundry, but I never knew about it until I started doing the research on this book. But as you can imagine, uh, it's quite likely that there was some Chinese laundry there before, and maybe someone retired, and then so did my father, and so he had a chance to go there. So anyway, he went there. Now, uh, here's something that I, I also learned uh, that I didn't know at the time you know, I was growing up or anything. Uh, later, when I was doing research on this, I knew uh, more details about the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882 against laborers. And so I thought, well, my father got in because he had a store, you know, he had laundry. But then I then found out that laundry men were not considered merchants. Uh, they didn't have merchandise to sell or anything. They were considered laborers. So then I started thinking, well, how did my father get in, you know, if he's a laborer and they're not letting laborers in? Well, I found this document that shows that when he was in Augusta, before he left, he became, quote unquote, a paper merchant. Just as we have paper signs, he was a paper merchant. He paid $500 and joined a partnership with seven or eight other people in a store in Augusta. He never worked in that store, as best I can tell, but he had that piece of paper that said he was a merchant. And that's how he was able to, like, circumvent the exclusion against uh, him being a laborer, because no one came and checked to see if he actually had a store. If they'd come to Macon and saw he was running a laundry, you know, he would have been in big trouble. But I guess apparently they didn't. So, anyway, that's, that's uh, my father. Now, his brother, on the other hand, had a different model of, of history. And it, it's also very common, uh, you know, maybe these are two of the more common uh, paradigms and the slight variations. But he came over, he's uh, the younger brother, uh, so he came over, but he, he was already married when he left China. He had a family, he had three sons in China, and like many Chinese, they left their families behind in China when they came to the United States. And there are probably a lot of different reasons. Uh, some of them intend to stay forever, they plan to go back after a while, some of them, um, it, it was considered more risky to bring the women and over, and uh, so they'd leave them behind. Uh, the mother-in-law probably had something to say with this too, and so you know the daughter-in-law stayed behind, and, and so forth. Now, as history you know shows us, that, you know there was uh, political and, and uh, war reasons why he couldn't reunite with them. So he was a bachelor in effect uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Eventually, he came and he worked in Augusta for a while, and then he came down to Macon and worked with my father. Uh, uh, my father helped him kind of get settled, and then he got a laundry in Atlanta. But he didn't reunite with his family until like about 1950. So he was alone, you know, essentially for about 15 years. And um, I see this common pattern with a lot of other uh, Chinese immigrants of that period. Uh, in a sense, that was a kind of a, a fortuitous thing for me personally because uh, him not having his children with him, he sort of, I was like his surrogate, you know, child. Uh, so when he would come to visit us, you know, he would shower us with candy and, and gifts and stuff like that. So we were uh, very fond of Uncle Joe, you know, as we called him, you know. We, I, I, you know I, I had more regard for Uncle Joe than I did for my father, you know. I have a hard time getting a quarter out of my father every time my uncle would come. He'd give me a dollar every time he left. So I was very happy to see Uncle Joe. Um, so it, this is a photograph of my parents in 1928 when, when my mother uh, came over and when they were married. So uh, remember my father came over in 1921 and then he went back in 1928 and came over with my mother. And now, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, 
the interrogation at Angel Island uh, is quite intense, quite detailed. Uh, this is just a very, very small excerpt out of about 100 pages of single space type uh, transcript of my father's interrogation in 1921 that I was able to retrieve from the archives. Actually, when I went to the archives, I was kind of, uh, let's say, pessimistic. I was thinking, oh, we can't find you know, this. It might even be there. And I read about it and I went there. And, and when I had that um, ship passage receipt that I showed you earlier from my mother, I thought, well, that would help. At first, I, I couldn't find it because I, was, I used that date, and I thought that was the date that she arrived. And I, I looked at the ships that came in that day, and that ship that come in that day. But the archivists there and the, the people there are very knowledgeable and they're very helpful. So if any of you, you know, have uh, ambition to go there, you know, you should, you should try, you know, you'd, you'd be surprised. So that they point out that that was the date that she left Hong Kong, not the day that she arrived in San Francisco. So they got the ship manifest, because you need the ship manifest to find the catalog number for where they can find the records in, their, in the catacombs of the archive. And, uh, I looked at the manifest and I saw my mother's name there. It was kind of exciting, you know. And then I looked and I looked and I couldn't find my father's name in there. And I thought, well, this is very odd. They surely must have come over together. How come my father's name is not on the ship manifest? And so anyway, they retrieved the records. And as I was reading it, they kept referring to someone named Ben Jung. And that was apparently my father's name that I never knew until a few years ago. His American name was Frank Jung. But, and so I'm looking for that name. But he didn't have that name when he came. He, it, it was, you know, kind of uh, phoneticized, but it was B E N spelled on the dot on the manifest. And so he was actually on the record, but I just didn't recognize him. So those are some of the little adventures you get when you do this type of research. You know, you kind of have to be a little flexible and adaptive and try to figure out what's going on. So anyway, in this part of the transcript, which I kind of underlined some red parts because they really stood out to me when I was reading this. It, you know, it's kind of a, a eerie kind of thing, you know, eerie are readings, records of your father when he first came over all these years earlier. And so you have this vicarious feeling that you're like in the room watching or listening. And he got confronted a number of times, and so they said, uh, your father says there is, in other words, he's saying, your answer is different from what your father is saying. My father says, I'm just telling you the truth. And then later on, you know, about in the middle, the interrogator says, your father doesn't say so. And my father says, well, I'm telling you the truth. And then you see down again, they confront him again. Are there any water buffaloes? My father says, no, your father didn't say so. And my father says, I'm just telling you the truth. I didn't see any while I was there. Anyway, my, my heart raced a bit every time I heard these confrontations, you know. Because, well, on the other hand, like, I guess I was reassured. I knew my father got in, you know, so I knew things kind of had to end well. But still, as I'm reading this, I'm wondering what's going on. And my first thought was uh, they were trying to bait him. You know, they were just sort of saying this, you know, to see if he would change his mind. Uh, then I, I said to myself, surely they didn't send someone back to the village to see if there were any water buffalo there 75 years ago. You know, how could they prove, you know, what's right and what's wrong? Uh, so, you know, these are the kinds of things that could get you disqualified and deported, you know, if the uh, interrogator, you know, doesn't buy your story. So, the way I like to think of it is that my father never changed his mind, he never changed his answer, and maybe he bluffed his way in, I don't know, because he was a paper son. I mean, uh, the, the person who they're referring to as your father was not really his father. So there could be good reasons why their stories don't match. So when he came in in 1928, after he married and came back, um, you know, you go through the same thing. How many houses are there, blah, blah, blah. And I'm sure, you know, you've read about this in various books. But um, they have this one part which shows you the zeal and thoroughness with which the immigration service works because they went and pulled out his record from 1921 and compared his answers, you know, as, as he's going along there. And if you had other relatives who came in, they'd go and pull all those out too and cross-check cross them. So now the bottom it says uh, about some question, that, you know, when he had changed his mind about something, they said, you were asked the same question when you were an applicant for admission and you have answered it precisely in the same way you do now. 
He first stated that they were all dwellings, and then you change, just like you're doing right now. Are you memorizing a story, or are you um, stating the facts? Now that's pretty <laughs> blood curdling <laughs> to be there, you know, being interviewed and suddenly be confronted with, you know, hey, they they got a record of everything I said seven years ago. You know, how am I going to get out of this one? You know, and. Um, that was a real eye-opener for me, but as I said, he got through. Um, years later, I actually went and found the records for my uncle, my Uncle Joe, and uh, I was reading his. And uh, he, his paper said that he came from Hong Kong, which he did not come from. And uh, they asked him a lot of questions about Hong Kong. When was the last flood in Hong Kong? Where did the streetcar go? Where's the movie theater? He didn't know zilch, you know, about Hong Kong. I mean, it was clear that he was fraudulent. And I, I'm reading this. I'm, I'm zeroizing these things as fast as I can. I'm scanning and I'm reading them and everything because I have a limited amount of time to get these things xeroxed. And finally, I come to the last page, and it says, admission denied. I was flabbergasted. I mean, when I read that, I, you know, what? You know, I pulled the paper back. I mean, I knew he got in. And yet, I could see why they would, I mean, they literally said, you know, you are a fraud. You are not who you say you are. You know, that, those are almost the literal words he said to him. And, and then they said, do you wish to appeal? <laughs> so, so he checked with his attorney and he appealed and he got in. Now, I don't know how he got in because the record kind of ended there. Then there was uh, another, uh, she in there was a telegram from uh, Washington, and it said land him, and I didn't know what that meant, so I went and asked the archive. It says, "What does this mean?" It says land him. That was all that the telegram said. Is that all oh, that, that means? Let him in. So, <laughs> so I'm saying, well, he's a fraud. It was pretty clear he's a fraud. You know, they told him he couldn't come in. How's it? Two days later, he can come in. You know, was it some bribe? I don't know what happened. Um, but. And you know, the archives, you know, you get a different interrogator on a different day, uh, in a bad mood one day, he's in a good mood one day, you know. There are a lot of very fortuitous, uh, unfortunate things that happen, you know, to determine whether you get in or not. My mother also went through intense interrogation, and uh, since, you know, she didn't even know the paper father, and hardly knew my father at all, arranged marriage, you know, and so forth, so she had to memorize all these things, and I won't burden you with all the details you can sort of glean from this a little bit, but there was one part where they showed her a photograph of her alleged father-in-law, and they asked, who was this, and she said she didn't know. <laughs> and said, well, how is it that you lived in this house for like four or five months and you don't recognize your, your, your own father-in-law or something like this? And I thought that was the end of that, you know. But they admitted her anyway. Um, so, you know, go figure. It was pretty uh, amazing. So again, Megan is in the middle of, of Georgia, right smack down in the middle. Um, Population at the time I was living there by 1950 was roughly 55,000. Now it's probably doubled. Uh, this is a rough demographic in the 2000 census. Uh, Chinese have gone all the way from when I was there, there were six of us. It's all the way up to 88, okay? What's that, about a 12 fold increase? <laughs> yeah. uh, but there are some other Asians there and so forth. But there's still, you know, kind of a small amount. Atlanta actually is mushroom. Tremendously, there's been a lot of uh, Koreans, uh, Taiwanese, uh, Vietnamese, and so forth. So, but at the time I was living there, uh, in Atlanta, probably less than 50 Chinese that I was aware of, and they were almost all um, single um, Chinese laundrymen, uh, or maybe a couple of families, and maybe a few children, but that was it. Um, this will give you a little picture of like what it's like uh, in Macon. Um, now, growing up, I couldn't always sort out everything as to like what parts were specific to being Chinese and what parts were specific to being poor, what parts were specific to being Southern and so forth. So they were all sort of commingled. But this is the street that I live on, Mulberry Street, a pleasant little street. Our laundry was sort of like right about here on this side of the street, directly across from this tall building. Um, this 
by the way, and that you can't hardly see this white thing standing up. That's a Confederate war uh, a soldier, a Confederate monument. Now, this is an interesting thing that happened. I, I went back to visit um, a couple of times in the last few years, uh, and, and once actually I, I got to talk about Southern Fried Rice in Macon. Uh, at, they had a Georgia Literary Festival, and so that was a really interesting experience. And so when I went down there to look at the site, that thing was gone. It had been moved catty corner across the street uh, on a little triangle. And I, I thought I was losing my mind. I said, I could have sworn that that thing was over here. Did, how did, you know, could I possibly be wrong? Because it looked okay where it was, you know. And where it used to be were now left turn lanes. So I thought, well, this is really interesting, you know. You know, you think of the South as being really wedded to the Confederacy and so forth. And here they were willing to move the iconic monument out of the way for left turn lanes. So, so is this progress? I don't know. Anyway, I had a very limited uh, world in a sense. Like, we didn't have a car. Town was small enough that you could walk or bike pretty much everywhere that you kind of wanted to go. So our lobby right here is kind of in the middle of town. Like this right over here probably is like the main business street. So we're one block away. And behind me was this big church, an Episcopal church. And it was sort of like my fantasy land. It was sort of like my Disneyland. Uh, because I would go there and play. And uh, it was sort of like castles and Gothic cathedral and everything like that. Little nooks and crannies and gardens and so forth. So it was kind of nice in that way. Uh, then, uh, what I spent a lot of time was walking up the street to my elementary school, Whittle School. It's about four blocks, so I spent a lot of my time going up and down to school. Uh, in terms, because we lived downtown, there weren't many other kids. You know, we were uh, in kind of the business section, and I would spend my time just wandering around the downtown, which was like maybe four square blocks, I, mean, I would spend a lot of time in the movie theaters eventually. That's why I've kind of marked them Rialto, Capital, Bid, Ritz, and so forth. And that's sort of where I learned about the world, you know, because we didn't have TV at that time yet. And we had radio and, and stuff, but uh, I'd go to the movies, especially on hot days, you know, because some of them were air-conditioned, uh, and so that was a big plus. But my other big window in the world was I had to walk maybe a few extra blocks down this way uh, to the public library. The public library is really what kind of socialized me, you know, taught me about the world because I was very interested in books. And I mean, that's why I ended up being a professor or something like this. But I know that without that public library, I, you know, I, I wouldn't have learned a whole lot. Uh, I mean, you learn so much in school, but, you know, you learn so much on your own. So uh, this was the, the little small area that I kind of lived in, and you know it seemed kind of okay. I mean, we, we, but this wasn't uh, a bad experience exactly, but it was a very kind of limited thing. So people would ask me like, "Well, where did you ride on the bus?" Well, I said I didn't ride the bus because I could walk everywhere or ride a bicycle everywhere. But you know, people are always kind of wondering. Well. Chinese um, were kind of like neither black nor white. Uh, on a bus, we would have been okay if we sat in the so-called white section. That wasn't a problem at that time, you know, when we were growing up. This is a picture of our laundry about the time we left it. We lived upstairs, I kind of circled the windows. This was really not a house or anything, this was sort of like storage area that we had like two big rooms, and then as uh, the children grew older, my father um, put up partitions. Um, uh, he went and got sort of like the equivalent of drywall, but they didn't have actually have drywall, so he partitioned the rooms so there'd be four rooms, so there'd be more privacy. Um, we didn't have uh, anything. We had a, like a sink and a stove, a little small two-burner gas stove, and uh, we had a refrigerator. But those were sort of all the other things other than beds. We, we just, we had very, you know, impoverished uh, living circumstances. And, it's, and we had no air conditioning either, by the way. And in uh, the summer, it gets to be like in the high 90s and high humidity. And on top of that, you're sitting on top of a steam laundry, okay? <laughs> so it can be extremely hot. And I can remember many, many nights not being able to sleep until, you know, you perspired enough that you know kind of kind of cooled off and went to sleep. 
So I don't recommend living above a laundry. <laughs> Might be better living behind it, but don't don't ever live above it. Now, uh, I later uh, discovered when I started doing research for this, I found this photograph of our laundry in 1906. And as I said uh, before, growing up, I never. I never, I never even met, questioned whether the laundry existed prior to us being there. I just assumed, you know, when we came, when my father came, it, the laundry was there. But I found this archive on the internet that showed this photograph. It wasn't that they wanted to show a picture of our laundry. They actually wanted to show a picture of the big building next to it, which is the hotel. And that hotel is where uh, I would go in there and read all the comic books until they threw me out, and then I'd eventually buy one, maybe. But when I grew up, they had torn down all those uh, balconies, uh, those sort of French-style balconies out in front. So when I first looked at this picture, I thought it was a mistake, you know, that it wasn't it. But once I saw those three windows and that little white sign, which I think physically is the same sign that we had uh, in front of our laundry, that sign, and this sign, but maybe repainted because 50 years probably need to repaint the sign or something. So that was really exciting uh, to me um, doing this. And there were a lot of those other kind of little discoveries that you, you don't anticipate. So I checked with the archivist in the uh, public library, Pamela Good Genealogy Center for Central Georgia, and he looked up some things for me that were really useful for my research which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. So people ask, well, you know, like what was life there for us? Uh, remember, we were living there before the civil rights uh, movement really got going. We left just before, you know, uh, there became activism. So in those days, it was a sleepy little town. Uh, Jim Crow laws prevailed. Um, various clear distinction between whites and blacks. Uh, if you go in the, uh, say, butcher shop, um, the butcher would always wait on all the white customers first before they wait on uh, the so-called colored. And uh, in restaurants, there were separate restaurants for whites and coloreds, but white restaurants, realizing they could make money, could sell to the blacks, but they just couldn't let them come in and sit in there and serve, so they would create a takeout window. So they were one of the early runners of you know, drive through or whatever. You know, it's like, okay, you can't come and eat here, but you can buy, buy the food. Um, when I was a kid, I was very interested in baseball and so forth, and I remember how exciting it was. The Brooklyn Dodgers, in those days, now the LA Dodgers, were coming through the exhibition season. They were going to play a game against the local uh, minor league team. Uh, I, I kind of hesitate to give the name of our team. Uh, it was the Macon Peaches. Uh, but, but, you know, really ferocious sounding name for a baseball team. And my wife likes to make fun of our whole, our high school was named after Lanier, Sidney Lanier, who was a famous poet in the South. So the football team, all the athletic teams were called poets. So here comes the Lanier High School football team, the Lanier High Poets, are coming out of the field and you know, just dancing out in the field. We had a very poor team, we almost lost all our games. <laughs> So um, where did, you know, Tiny spit in at least Macon? Um, so there are these little subtle things that um, no one really gave me an official lecture or lesson, but I can remember very vividly going into Cress's dime store to drink from the water fountain, and there'd be the white and the colored side by side. So I had a 50-50 chance, and I'm sure on more, more than one occasion I drank from the colored fountain. But on many occasions, someone would tap me on the shoulder and kind of nudge me over to the white fountain. They didn't, they didn't say, you know, you, you're bad or you're wrong, or, but, it, you know, yeah, come over here, come over there. So that, that's how, you know, I kind of got socialized into the fact that, you know, I was, for that purpose, you know, I could be considered white. Another occasion that I remember vividly, I had this um, friend, his mother uh, worked in a tailor shop, down the street from us, and so he would be there after school sometimes, and so we became playmates because I didn't have a lot of other kids to play with. I had this one friend, MC, it was his name, I don't know what it stood for, but um, became a famous name for a black person. Um, anyway, MC and I would play, and one day my father told me that a customer had come in the laundry and told him that he should reprimand me and tell me not to play with MC. 
And um, it really kind of shocked me. I mean, I was aware of racial prejudice and so forth, but because we were display mates and friends, you know, I, I was kind of shocked. My father didn't say, uh, enforce anything, he just sort of communicated that to me. But I kind of basically ignored it. But then, see, I, we had a lot of interesting experiences. I was thinking of one um, that once uh, we were inside having lunch upstairs, we lived upstairs. My mother was very security conscious, very paranoid. And maybe paranoid wasn't correct, but she was worried, okay? She had good reason to worry, I guess. And so we'd always have to lock the door morning, noon, and night, you know, even in broad daylight in a, in a safe area and everything. And so MC and I would sometimes sit on the stairs and read comic books, and then when it was time for lunch, we'd go in and then we'd barricade our door. So he'd be out there, and so we're all sitting there one day, and, and we hear someone moaning out there or something. It's like, way one. Listen again, way one. And uh, I, I, you know, maybe speaking it the way we learned it himself. <laughs> Still an accent or something, but it translates to open the door, you know. And so we look around and we do a body count. Well, we're all here, you know. <laughs> Who could this be outside who's, you know, moaning in Chinese to open the door? It's MC who's picked up a little Chinese from him. Because <laughs> the only way we could get in the house is to, to call our mother to open the door, you know, to unbolt the door to let us in. Uh, my other probably primary playmate, who I actually saw a couple years ago, uh, my best friend in elementary school. Uh, we were like the prince and the pauper. Uh, Richard was a Jewish boy, and uh, his parents worked during the daytime. So after school, he would go home, and he had a, a nanny, a, a, a colored woman who was his nanny, did cooking and cleaning in the house. And they uh, had an apartment, uh, which was pretty well to do, you know, lots of fancy furniture and everything. Uh, but not of any interest to me, but he had an electric train, he had a Lionel electric train, and he had all the latest toys and everything. And so he'd invite me over there after school and we would play with his toys. And uh, so, you know, it was kind of one extreme to the other. And sometimes his parents would give me a ride home in their car. I mean, it was the only time I rode in the car for a long, long time because we didn't have a car. It wasn't much of a ride, it was like three blocks, but it was still kind of inside. <laughs> so, um, but you know, uh, it, it, it was sort of like, I didn't have any Chinese to relate to, so I would relate to whoever I could, you know, which was kind of understandable, I guess. Um, so in terms of like access to, you know, public facilities, um, for all practical purposes, they're, they're, no one gave us any problems. Uh, we went to white schools, uh, we went to the right, white movie theaters. Uh, we could have gone to a white restaurant if we'd been inclined, but we never went to a restaurant because my mother did all the cooking in addition to everything else, working laundry, uh, bringing up children, and uh, cooking up every meal. Um, the uh, buses and trains, any of those things, we could be white now. In Mississippi, on the other hand, um, you, you, if you were Chinese, you couldn't go to a white school. Um, until about the late 1940s, early 50s, uh, um, they were still more segregationist there. Because um, part of it was they were worried that um, some of the early Chinese uh, had children with black people. And so under the theory of one drop of blood, you know, so, and so they didn't want black people into the white school, and so if they let Chinese children into the black, into the white school, they were worried that some of them would be actually integrating their schools, you know, well before Brown versus Board of Education. So they just said, you know, no Chinese allowed. Okay, um, here, here's some uh, evidence about how Macon was like, well, well before even my parents came. This is 1910, a news article that my a librarian fr uh, friend, I call him friend, uh, at the time he wasn't my friend, I didn't know him from anyone. It turns out that when I went there uh, to this Georgia Literary Conference, I went to meet him because he had been so helpful I went to meet him in person. And he whipped out my junior high school yearbook, you know, uh, which I had a copy of, but he shows me that his father had been a year behind me <laughs> in the same school. So that, that was kind of a real surprise when we had that kind of connection. So anyway, he sent me this article that came from 1910 local newspaper, which just simply tells you that 
the, this, the local white school had denied admission to this Chinese girl because she was an alien. Uh, they also, he sent me articles about uh, how the local newspaper would try to uh, explain to uh, mostly, I guess, the white people what it was that Chinese people are like. So they have events like Chinese New Year and they do some strange things. They eat curious edibles. Um, this talks about um, how they're gonna, all these Chinamen are going to gather in Stanley's laundry or and have a general blowout in the eating line on New Year's Eve, and so forth. And when I first read this, I kind of thought, well, this is really kind of uh, you know racist in a way, um, kind of mocking Chinese and so forth. And I thought maybe it was specifically Southern. But uh, later I, I read, even in New York Times, this was the way journalists wrote when they wanted to be pseudo-anthropological, that they would sort of take this sort of air of superiority and kind of uh, diminish the curious things that other peoples do, you know, rather than accepting them for what they do. So they would talk about all the weird things we eat, okay? Um, not to say, well, they don't say anything whether they ever taste them or whether they liked them, but this would be the tenor of their so anyway, growing up, um, as I said, in a place where everyone's black and white, I knew very early on I was Chinese. Although I didn't really know exactly what that all entailed or meant, but growing up, my parents spoke to us in Chinese. Uh, my father knew more English than my mother did because, you know, he worked, worked with customers. My mother uh, didn't really uh, deal with customers very much, so she didn't really learn a whole lot of English. It's a basic English while she was there. Maybe in the grocery store, she would be able to point to things and, and she would learn, you know, she could recognize what people were saying, but she couldn't articulate it herself. So we learned Chinese, which unfortunately I, I didn't continue because there was no one else to speak to other than my siblings and my parents, and that's kind of limiting. Uh, our food was, you know, Chinese food. It was either uh, things that my parents ordered, mail ordered from San Francisco, like the dried stuff that you know that they could uh, resurrect and with dropping in water and so forth, or she would adapt local things and cook them, you know, uh, stir fry and, and Chinese style. But we didn't know a whole lot about the more exotic things. We didn't know anything about like dim sum or anything like that. Uh, never heard of it until we came to California. Uh, we lived differently, but again, like I said, part of that was uh, what I call poverty versus, uh, you know, Chinese style, because I didn't know exactly what Chinese style was, you know. Uh, so I could misattribute it. Um, in a way, we really weren't poor, but we lived poor. I mean, my <laughs> parents were very frugal, they saved everything, you know, they sent money back to China, and they, like so many other Chinese, don't trust banks, so, you know, they keep money at home. And uh, I, even to this day, when I go to this Chinese market and everything, I see the immigrants whip out their wallet with a huge bill, pat wad of bills, like they're just waiting to be mugged or something. <laughs> like, they don't, you know, seem to carry uh, checks or anything. It's just cold cash. And that was the way they grew up. They never bought anything unless they had all the money for it, you know, no credit or anything. And so they didn't put money out in the mattress. But we had these old tin cans from Caro Syrup. So my parents would stash money in that, and then they would hide it in various places, and in fear that you know the same thing happened to them that you know they needed to tell someone. So they trusted me with that. Well, I should say burdened me with the responsibility of knowing it. So on the back stairs, my father had some false uh, bottoms in the stairs. So if you pry it open, the the thing you step on underneath there was this empty space and then these cans full of money. <laughs> Uh, my mother had her own stash. She she took talcum powder cans, emptied the talcum powder, stashed the money in, and then got the talcum powder back in. And of course, I knew all this. Uh, so uh, if, me, if the house should catch on fire, my job was to run and grab the the carrots and, and talcum powder and run. Um, but my mother also entrusted me with other stuff that, you know, burdened me again, you know, by telling me about all the dangers of, of you know, prejudice and things like that. And, and taught us, you know, that we could expect people to make fun of us or this, that, and the other. And that, you know, we were outnumbered, you know, and that, you know, we shouldn't argue or fight, just kind of like turn the other cheek, just walk away and get out of the situation, you know, be very pragmatic. And, um, 
in general, in the city, though, you know, in town, we were um, treated fairly well. I mean, sometimes they'd be kind of mocking, you know, like people would always come up and do the slant eye thing, you know, uh, kids in school, or they wouldn't say, can you say something in Chinese? We want to hear some Chinese. Speak some Chinese for us. And, or they did the other thing. They would do the speaking in Chinese. They'd make up something that they thought was Chinese and say, what am I saying? What am I saying? <laughs> Well, you know, that was annoying, but, you know, you know, you could kind of live with that. In terms of media, we didn't have TV, as I said before, but we had comic books. And I actually found a comic book with a Chinese character in it. One of my favorite comics as a kid, yeah, Black Hawk. I, I love to read that. And I had mixed feelings about the fact that there was a Chinese character there, because as you can see, he was very different from the others. Um, all the other um, had guns, and they, they all each had their own little plane. They didn't think the Chop Chop could fly a plane because he always sat in the jump seat with Blackhawk, the leader, the one in the front. And they didn't give him a gun. I guess they thought he was like John Dick Cheney or something. And they didn't think he could be safe with a gun. So they gave him a meat cleaver. And so he was part of the team, you know. Uh, so they would, you know, make light of, of you know, his his mentality, and uh, that he w wasn't portrayed as being super smart or anything. And women were sort of portrayed in the, you know, sort of the dragon lady, uh, mystical, uh, mystic, you know, uh, Suzy Wong, exotic, yeah, right thing, yeah. And so in this comic strip, this dragon lady type thing. So clearly, you know, people in Macon uh, thought of us Chinese as being, uh, you know, different and um, they weren't always hostile. Sometimes it was just normal curiosity, but you know, sometimes you get a little irritated. People keep asking all these questions. Um, as I said before, my uncle had a laundry in Atlanta, and this is a picture of the laundry as it still stands. It's now actually being. It was then later run by his son, and actually now one of his grandsons is doing it. And I don't think his business is doing too well, but uh, it's. It was. A, located originally on the site that uh, the city appropriated to build part of the parking lot for the football stadium, so they moved around the corner. So the neighborhood's not all that good. But, um, you know, he, he brought up four children, sent them all to college, you know, running this laundry. So, you know, there was something to be set for. But uh, he uh, and some other Chinese laundrymen that I met, the, the way I met these laundrymen was uh, on Sundays, sometimes, which was the day of rest, uh, where we didn't open laundry, my father would take us uh, by train to Atlanta, which was like a two-hour train ride. And we'd spend a couple of hours there uh, talking to some of these Chinese laundrymen. And, uh, well, I wouldn't talk to them. I would just sit there and li listen. I mean, I'm 8, 10, 12, or whatever at most. And so I don't have a whole lot to do. I'm just sitting there twiddling my thumbs, waiting for my father to get back on the train to go home. But still, it was kind of like an outing, you know, I got to ride on the train and this, that, and the other. And, um, but I, by osmosis, I learned a lot just listening to them, you know, talk. It was really uninteresting, but they would generally talk about people they knew. They'd gossip some about various people. they talk about things in China. they talk about the, you know, world political situation. Things that the kids not all that interested in. But these men uh, didn't necessarily all live in Atlanta. They may have come from some other little town within a couple of miles, and they would congregate there. And there was also an association hall, and, and they would some of them would go there and gamble. And I know my father must have gambled some because I, I know my mother would reprimand them and, and this and that, or tell us about it. And then say, "Your father's no good. He wastes all his money gambling." Blah blah blah, and uh, this sort of thing. And. She did also have some resentment because he would send money back to his family in China and he wasn't too eager to let her send money back to her family in China. So um, there was that sort of like tension, if you will. But what was important for me was to know the, the, these laundrymen because they were the only other Chinese that I really knew, you know. And so that kind of gave me a larger uh, base on which to understand what being Chinese was. Um, we did encounter a few Chinese who, who were like in the military. Uh, they were maybe second generation Chinese who were stationed at, at Camp Wheeler nearby. They would come to town and 
we have some pictures in our photo album of us little kids playing with, uh, like in the park with these soldiers. So my parents would invite them for dinner and stuff like that because they were probably a little homesick too. So it was kind of mutually beneficial for us. So parents taught us that, you know, as I said before, uh, that, you know, being Chinese, we're different and we're not going to be treated uh, as well as, you know, say other white people would be. Um, my mother, particularly, and much more so than my father. My father never really talked about these things for whatever reason, but my mother uh, really told us over and over about her experiences, say, like at Angel Island. Um, she had a very unpleasant experience there, um, not the least of which was the interrogation, but she also had ring uh, worm, and so she was uh, hospitalized for a few days and obviously not feeling very well. I think she attributed to that was the medicine they gave her that made her sick, which may not have been entirely true, but it was still a very negative experience. And so she would tell me about these things, about how the Chinese were not allowed in, and how they had all these questions, and they asked all these questions about the village, and some of the other. And I just thought she was exaggerating when I was a kid. I, I can't be that bad. You know, this is America, right? And, and uh, then later I found out, yeah, what she told me was like what I read from other documents. Stuff. So consequently, uh, I had a strong aversion to Angel Island, and so uh, over the years I had chances to go, and people said, oh, you should go, you should go. I said, no, I don't feel up to it. You know, I felt like a, this strong negative emotion until actually yesterday, um, because my friends, uh, Joe uh, Chan and Liz Chan, who are both here today, their docents there, and um, they were very kind to uh, invite us over, and we went over and got a wonderful tour, and uh, as many of you know, it's going to be reopened in, what, 2010? Yeah. February. February. Yeah. So, you should all uh, make special attention to that, because you're very close by, and if you're fortunate, you'll get the chance to give you a tour. Uh, so that was um, helped uh, uh, my understanding a lot, because, I mean, I, as I was there, I was kind of visualizing my parents and all these other Chinese immigrants who went through all the ordeal of you know, going through the immigration station. Um, so, um, because I knew I was a paper sign, see, I, in a way, I, I thought all Chinese um, of my generation knew about paper signs because almost all of them were paper signs. But um, because my mother told me about that you know, and said, you know, your real name is not such and such, your name is really this and that. <laughs> So, as a kid, I'm wondering, what is this? And how come? You know, this seems very odd, you know. And, uh, but I didn't have anyone to talk to about it because I couldn't go up and tell people at school, hey, my name's not really John, you know. Um, what's your paper name? <laughs> so, I had to keep it to myself. So, uh, when I came to San Francisco, I didn't quite know how to ask other adolescents that I knew, you know, should I ask them? You know, are you the baby son? You know, blah, blah, blah. And, well, you know, maybe they don't want to talk about it. But anyway, later, eventually, I found out a lot of them didn't know it, you know, which kind of surprised me. But then after I thought about it, I can understand why a lot of parents wouldn't tell their children. But my mother lost no opportunity to tell me about it. She really hammered it in so that um, I was very uh, defensive and aware of that. When we would ever have any sort of, you know, confrontation or uh, so-called, I mean, confrontation is too strong a word, but she told us, you know, that, you know, you're outnumbered, you know, you can't do anything about it, just turn away, avoid the situation, and, and basically that's what we did. On the other positive side, uh, they did teach us a little bit about Chinese history. When I say culture, I don't mean in any great detail or anything, but we, we learned enough to know that our heritage was very uh, strong and that uh, our background, you know, there were a lot of things to be proud of. So even though we had no direct contact with that, that I think that was very, you know, beneficial. Um, so kind of as an overview, I'd say, you know, definitely sometimes, you know, you feel a little kind of out of place, especially because there's no other Chinese there. Um, when we would ever see a Chinese anywhere, you know, you almost like, do a double take, you know, <laughs> try to uh, look, and then, and then uh, in the South, if you ever see another Chinese person, you have to go talk to them, because it would be rude otherwise. If you're in San Francisco, you see another Chinese person, you're not going to go talk to them. <laughs> and, you know, they're all over the place. But, 
in the South, you know, it was a rare event, you know. It was like a sighting, you know. So, gee, I went out of town, I thought that's what I was trying to do. <laughs> so, we didn't have a lot of people to relate to. My parents were extremely isolated. I mean, for us kids, it was a little different because, you know, we at least knew English and we'd go to movies and stuff like that. But my parents really didn't have any social life. They just worked all the time and then just rested and then worked and stuff. So I didn't really always like being Chinese. I mean, I kind of sort of said to myself, it's just so unfair. How come I couldn't either be black or white? I mean, <laughs> well, Chinese is like, you know, you're just by yourself kind of thing. But looking on the positive side, or, you know, you can say, well, you, you learn a lot about solitude, you learn a lot about reflection and looking at things and analyzing things. Uh, that was just one occasion, I guess we'd say, that being in Chinese in Georgia and Macon was good, in, in a sense. They even wrote a little article about us in the local paper and took our picture. Uh, this was on the occasion when Madame Shang Kai-shek came to get an honorary degree at a local uh, women's college, Wesleyan College. And it was on a very, very hot June day. You can see I'm wearing these short pants there. And they dragged us out because it was a photo op. They said, Madam Shanghai Shek's coming to town. Oh, I hear there's some little Chinese children downtown. Let's bring them out and uh, line them up as part of the ceremony. Uh, I asked my older sister, did we ever meet Madam Shanghai Shek? And he said, no, she never even came and pat us on the head or anything. But we were whipped out there for a like, you know, show. And, uh, this is the other part of the article I showed you earlier about the girl who was denied admission in 1910 to the school in Macon. Uh, not only did they deny her admission in 1910, but in 1943 they misspelled her name as Miss Schoon. Uh, okay, Miss Schoon, which really should be Miss But in any case, uh, this, this part was the other part of the article in um, 1910. And um, she was there partly because her two older sisters were there, the one who met, uh, married uh, Sun Yat Sen. Uh, she didn't actually go to college in Macon, uh, but she was there until she was about 13. And then, uh, so when she came back to the United States in 1943 on the historic um, tour of the country to uh, raise money and be the first woman, I believe, to speak to, to address the Congress. Uh, to try to recruit uh, support for the war effort in China against Japan. Um, she came to Macon, and that was why she, she was there. Of course, at that time, I didn't know anything about why she was there. I was six years old, and I was totally disinterested and uh, very uncomfortable because it was a very hot day. <laughs> so finally, at some point, when my sister, my two older sisters got older, uh, my parents realized that or felt that we really needed to be moved to the Chinese community. So San Francisco seemed to be the target place. And uh, so we kind of moved out stages. Um, my father stayed behind actually by himself for about three or four more years uh, to you know, support us with the laundry before he sold it and retired. So my mother and my older sister were sort of the uh, first contingent to go out here. And then a couple of years later, um, the rest of the children came out. But uh, this is a pretty remarkable thing uh, that my mother was able to do, um, given that she knew very little English. Uh, of course, coming to San Francisco and being near China, she could find people who knew Chinese and she could communicate with. But still, considering that she had no responsibilities of this sort uh, in all the years she was in Macon, her assignment was to go out and get my sister situated in, in college and uh, find some real estate, buy some property, preferably a building uh, that had a store downstairs and a residence above upstairs. That's the Chinese model. And so she was able to do that. And she, she talked like she knew what she was talking about. She'd always come back and talk about interest rates and this, that, and the other. <laughs> and um, she was ahead of her time because uh, at that time, Chinese did not extend probably beyond Leavenworth or Hyde Street. They were kind of all clustered close to Chinatown. And she got us situated on Polk Street, uh, Polk and Clay at that time. There were virtually no Chinese living in that area. So anyway, uh, we moved there and I suddenly realized, uh, probably the first time, I didn't know what it meant to be Chinese. 
because here I, I show up in Chinatown and I see all these Chinese people. I said, okay, I'm, I'm with all these Chinese people now. And I didn't know half the time what they were talking about. You were speaking English. <laughs> um, I didn't know anything about Chinese etiquette or customs, or, you know, very minimal. Um, I think once on one uh, occasion, my father had these little teeny little firecrackers and he fired them off, I think on VJ Day or something. Uh, not anything to do with New Year's. We didn't know anything about New Year's. Um, so I come to San Francisco, and uh, so I, I go to Lowell High, and I meet uh, these Chinese students, you know, Chinese American students, and they say, "Oh, you know, where are you from? You know, Georgia. You know, what are you doing down there? How come you all, you know, got stuck down there? Blah blah blah." And uh, how would you like to join a Chinese student club? And I thought to myself, Chinese student club? What is that? You know, and I said, I'm thinking to myself, well, why would you have a Chinese student club? I mean, we didn't have one in Macon. <laughs> <laughs> so it was totally new to me, you know, and so I thought, okay, you know, I'm Chinese, I'm a student. So, uh, so, you know, I could, so in a way, you know, I kind of wanted to be part of them, but in the end, I kind of felt a little, um, uncomfortable because I wasn't used to that type of self-segregation. I mean, I was used to being segregated by other people and I, I had no opportunity to cut myself off. <laughs> but I, I wanted to, you know, learn about, you know, Chinese and, and so forth. So I kind of gradually learned that. Um, shortly after I got here, my mother said, oh, you know, you need to learn to read and write, so you need to go to Chinese school. <laughs> um, and, you know, I knew a lot of these people told me that, you know, they went to English school in the daytime, or Chinese school around five o'clock, you know, and I was really demanding. So she sent me to this church, um, and we had like five students in the class. The others were six and seven years old, and I was 15. <laughs> and I was about six foot two by that time anyway. And so these little kids were writing circles around. And I don't think I lasted a week, and I just dropped out. So there was a lot of, you know, little adjustments I had to make. So, on the one hand, I wanted to be liked by these Chinese people who I had never been in contact with before in such numerosity, especially at my own age. And uh, I was reasonably accepted, partly as a curiosity, and also maybe they all liked me because I was tall. You know, they all wondered how I got to be so tall, and, and so I was sort of like the freak show or something for them, I don't know. So that kind of helped a little bit. But then I had the the question, you know, how much did I want to, you know, just identify only with Chinese? But that, but that was the way people did it then, so, you know, I kind of fell into that pattern. Now, going back to Macon for a moment, when my father finally left, like four years later, after we had left, the local newspaper actually wrote an article about it, which was kind of nice. And when I first got a copy of it, I kind of laughed about this headline. And not a Chinese in a town for the first time in a century. Well, first of all, it really struck me very hard. I didn't know there were Chinese there a hundred years ago. And then why would you write an article about it? You know, I, I was thinking, are they, are they happy that they're not? Or are they sad that they're not? Um, and so that's why I read the article. I really started laughing because I underlined a few things that I thought were very strange because I had never heard of any of these things before. So talked about uh, my father uh, coming to America and uh, saving up money and everything, and uh, his father was already, well, my, fa my grandfather never came to the United States, so this is fabricated, but to, to understand this, I guess he was trying to make this consistent with his paper father, because his paper father was here, so, you know, he had the, the story that, you know, he had kept in his back of his mind for some 25 years or so. Then it really got hysterical down in the middle when we talked about and saved up enough money to go back and marry his childhood sweetheart. Well, who was she? <laughs> I never heard that story. I mean, my parents didn't even know each other until he went back, you know, and I knew that for sure, you know. So this seemed odd. And then this last part about the Reverend Burke. He's the one who brought the Sun Sisters over uh, because the father trusted him uh, as a missionary to look after his daughters. Uh, he would take the little drunks to Sunday school. Well, that's partially true. I, he never took me, I can tell you that. I know I, I, know, I was maybe too young. He took my sisters, maybe. But then the, when I talked about my parents being devout followers of Confucius, I was really rolling on the floor. <laughs> 
because I knew that wasn't true. And as an example, I may have shouldn't give this example in the church, but um, I remember as a child on Sunday morning, I would hear the church bells ringing from the Episcopal Church behind us. And I don't remember exactly my age, but maybe five or six or something. And I'd say, to my, what, are, what are they ringing all these bells for, you know? My father said, oh, well, that's the church. The church is calling people to come to church. So I'd say, well, how come we're not going? So my father had an answer. He said, um, well, that's for lo fi. He said, um, they're evil during the week, and they need to go and get, <laughs> confess their sins on Sunday. And so, we don't need to go because we're good all week. <laughs> so, he, you know, his reasoning was impeccable, I guess. I didn't argue with him, I just accepted it. But I, I remember that quite vividly. So, when I read this thing, I, I never heard my parents talk about Confucius at all. But a, a part of this is, you know, people who want attention and they like to be helpful. And I know that um, customers would come in and give us books or pictures of uh, you know religious uh, nature and so forth. So um, in terms of this article, I think what happened as I tried to reconstruct it is when the man was writing the article, he would ask my father certain things like, uh, you know, did you did you go back to China and marry your sweetheart? And my father probably just kind of nodded and sort of <laughs> said, you know, I don't want to dispute him. If this is what he thinks, then it isn't going to hurt him to write it down. Uh, but my father didn't actually say that, you know. I, I think it was the, the, you know, American, you know, model of romance or that led to that question and my father just disagreed with and, and so forth. So, uh, when my sisters came, they adapted much more readily. Uh, Southern accents are really good on females. Uh, it really makes them extremely uh, more attractive. But for guys, it's not good. Uh, so, if I had to sort of look at how I had to deal with things. When I was around white people, so to speak, uh, I had to deal with questions like, you know, uh, am I white? Or, you know, can't. Because there was no one else around, so you know, I had to be as white as I could be, so they would accept me, so I, you know, I had to assimilate. Uh, but then on the other hand, every once in a while they look at me and they say, oh, he's Chinese, he must know all about this Chinese stuff, so let's go ask him to read this or translate this or demonstrate Kung Fu or show us something about, you know, some Chinese concept. Of course, I didn't know any of that stuff, so I couldn't really explain it. So then, when I got in the other situation, I came over here and I was surrounded by Chinese people, so I had a different problem, so I had to figure out, well, can I pass this Chinese, you know, how can I not be conspicuous? And how can, you know, um, I avoid getting rejected by Chinese? Because it was pretty clear to them I was an imposter or something. I didn't know enough about Chinese culture. So, uh, I became Chinese while I was in high school and college. But then, for the next quite a few years, I, in a way, I kind of found myself in the areas where there weren't very many Chinese at that time. Times have changed now. But like when I went to graduate school in, in Illinois, when I taught in Long Beach, when I taught in Toronto, I returned to the world of mostly white, you know, and in some cases black and white, but there weren't too many Asians around, so I had to kind of like forget about my Chinese again for a while, because it wasn't that functional. So, um, that's the problem that you're in, you know, you, you, you're sort of this, you're not, you're not this, you're not that. From my perspective, the way my early experience was, so, um, you know, I had, I had to sort of like learn to look around, see around, oh, they're all white people, okay, now I'm white, okay, no, they're all Asian, now I'm Asian, yeah. So, you had to like code switch, uh, and I think that's kind of what I did. Now, interestingly, now that um, I retired from, you know, teaching and so forth, and I started thinking about, you know, my uh, growing up in the South, I, my original intent was to write about my mother when I wrote this book because of all the difficult life that she had and all the uh, respect and admiration for all the things that she went through. Even though at the time I was growing up, I didn't always appreciate it. So um, it turned out that I got advice, and it was good advice, that they said, you can't write this book about your mother. Your mother can be a character in the book, but the book has to be about you. And so that's where I had to sort of change 
and then it became this southern fried rice thing. And so, um, at the time I wrote it, I have to say, I really wasn't sure how useful it was going to be. It was sort of like, I don't know, therapeutic or whatever, you just want to write this down. But the responses to it has been uh, very good from a lot of different people, uh, not all Chinese necessarily, because uh, I found that uh, a lot of people experience uh, some sort of isolation or some sort of being different or being alone, and different people draw different things from it. And it's always kind of amazed me, all the different things that people come up and tell me, oh, well, this is my favorite part, or this is my favorite part, or I can relate to this. So it's been quite an eye-opener for me. And so what I've been, been sort of telling people, I said, you know, it's really kind of interesting uh, how I was Chinese, and then I wasn't Chinese, and now as I'm, you know, doing all these books, I've suddenly become more Chinese than ever. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've learned a lot about Chinese history. Uh, and I found that it's very va valuable because there's a lot of things, well, like this, because I'm in a unique, relatively unique situation, being one of the few Southern Chinese of that era and who's writing about this. And I kind of felt um, that if no one wrote about this, then after it's, you know, we're all gone, then there won't be any record of it. And so I felt like it was useful to do that. And, and that's why this Mississippi project that I'm working on is so important, because um, it's a different kind of project from any that I've done before, because this is more of a biograph autobiographical thing. Now I'm dealing with a lot of people who, unlike the laundry book, in the laundry book everybody I dealt with has already gone on, virtually. So in, in the Mississippi book, uh, I'm dealing with a lot of people who are still alive and who have lots of stories to tell me and who are, you know, just showering me with information. I'm always information overloaded, but it's very exciting. And, and they have this sense that they really need to get, you know, more of their history told. So I feel very fortunate to uh, have gotten in good with them in that regard. And so that's the background of the book. And uh, I appreciate your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, you are six foot two. <laughs> uh, we don't have much time for uh, question and answer because uh, lunch time here, and Coke's getting very nervous. And uh, I'm gonna have uh, Dr. Jung over here, and during lunch period, you can come over and buy his book, ask a question. And um, I'm sure that he has time to answer that. Uh, how much are your books? Um, I'm selling them for $15 each for Okay. Two for $25, one for $15, no tax, and please buy. Okay. Thank